Maybe we should start with, we've already had some introductions, but just so we go through, maybe Martial, quickly, just give you an introduction and so on. Sure. So uh, I'm Martial, co-founder of OBB. We're a mobile gaming studio uh, founded in Paris. Our most recent game uh, is called SOP. It's a racing, uh, racing game, and we're working on a first shooter on mobile that is called Frag Pro Shooter, and it's going to be released in March of next year. Perfect. Roberta? So uh, I'm co-founder of Bossa Studios, a BAFTA-winning games company. We're known for Surgeon Simulator, I Am Bread, and World Drift. And we're all about creativity first. And so I'm Cathy. I'm CEO and co-founder of Wafa Games. So in Wafa Games, we believe in fundamental innovations by using technology to create games that haven't been created before and to empower the uh, in-game user-generated data. And so last year, we were uh, featured by MIT for the radical different uh, pathfinding algorithms and also the cloud-based um, battle and map level editor, which can be both used by designers as a tool and also gamers as platforms. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so today, uh, at this panel, we're going to be talking about creativity against science, the right balance for building successful games. And uh, Marcial, I know you guys are extremely data-driven mm -hmm. in, in terms of how you build your games. And uh, it would be nice to sort of hear the details of how do you use data and how do you use testing and you know, what it takes to really build your successful games. Sure. Um, for us, data, science, and data is very important. But uh, I think at first, we, we don't want to take data much into account. And for example, we were working on a first-person shooter these days, but we started working on that like one year ago. And if we had been looking at data points at the time, you know, uh, making a first-person shooter on mobile would have been like the most stupidest idea you could, uh, you could find. And now with Fortnite, you see you have this huge success, and the audience is kind of ready for it. So when building, designing a new game in the very first stage, I think it's wrong to be too data-focused. Yeah. For us, it also helps to uh, use data as a support tool because we know we're going we're gonna to be able to take very creative bets and do very creative and unique games, and then as data as a support tool so that we can test very quickly. We ship games in six months. We go to market very quickly because we know mobile is a risky, mar risky market. And then we're going we're gonna to test everything from consumer appeal with uh, marketing campaigns. And for us, you know, uh, having a, a decent cost of marketing is very important because it's what's going to help you to scale and then see the basic, uh, basic numbers with uh, retention and monetization around these users and build also uh, neural networks to, uh, to help us with uh, some, for example, matchmaking in the game. Yep. So everything, we do everything to create super unique games and ship them and get data as fast as possible. Wow, so data is important, but obviously creativity gives you that little edge, yeah. right? So to Roberta, you know, Bossa is well known for its creativity. Your game jams, your influencers using you on YouTube, and on top of that, you collaborate deeply with your community, with your users to build your games. It would be lovely just to hear a little bit more about how you use creativity to build your games. Um, at Bossa, we, we believe that you can only create revolutionary games as opposed to evolutionary games if you explore as many ideas as possible in the very early stages. So what we do on a, a monthly basis is a two-day game jam. Every single month, we stop the whole company. They organize themselves however they want and they create new games. And there's only one rule. The, the game needs to be playable at the end of the two days. And through this, we kind of created a pipeline of over 300 games that we can always explore further and add to the roadmap. But also, it allows us to start engaging very early on with the creators. Uh, there's, a, there's a massive thing, as you guys know about you know, the streamers, the YouTubers, everyone who's actually playing games nowadays. And we have a dedicated team uh, connected to, to the creators on an ongoing basis to create this iteration, just like a startup does for, for, uh, for products, for tech products. We're applying this to games, and it's been very successful. How many games do you create in the Games Jam? Usually between five to 10 games. 
It's impressive. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. impressive. So, Kathy, where are you? Where do you stand? Science or creativity? What is, what is uh, more important? So, at Waffle Games, we're actually a very technology-driven company, but yeah. but we see technology is uh, is a means to make new game plays, new game designs possible. So, so we don't really see uh, science and creativity as two separate things. Rather, they are coexisting ingredients blended together to unleash a magical power. And really, neither is uh, stronger than the other. Um, but if we ask ourselves, on one hand, why game is viewed as science? Well, as a business, it's highly data-driven, mm -hmm. in which uh, continuous A-B testing, constant performance monitoring are uh, ensuring the best game experience. Yeah. But, why, um, but at the same time, the in-game virtual world and storytelling need to be even seducive. Yes. Um, and that mental effect is not data-driven at all. But if we ask ourselves, what is really creativity? What is really science? Is mathematics a creative endeavor or science? I'm sure mathematicians will not think mathematics is science. But what about chess, right? What about business, any yeah. business at all? Myself, I'm a, I'm a professional chess player. Yeah. I was uh, the youngest national champion of chess. So at the chess board, yes, strong logic, uh, uh, execution, and, and strategy, and say calculation, the science perspective make a great chess player. But at the same time, it's a creativity, imagination, curiosity make a master. So it's like entrepreneurship. It's both logic as a science and also, in a way, it's poetry. Uh, it's romantic like a poetry. So you can't really separate them. No, it's super interesting because that's what I love about gaming, right? And the people in gaming. Because I think you have to have these two qualities yeah. yes. that in some ways are a little bit the yin and the yang mm. and like extremely different qualities. And, um, uh, and I think you're right. There has to be something that that catches the attention of, of the user. And I think that's something, I mean, I don't know, uh, Marcel, when, when you guys, the seductiveness is something that's also so important to you. Um, you know, how do you, uh, when you work with, with data and looking at things, like, do you think you can lose the seductiveness if you become too data-oriented? I think at some point, if you're, uh, if you're creating games by the numbers, and if you're only looking at uh, the competition where it is right now, it's. Yeah. You will make something that is a, a copycat or a follow-up to uh, to a trend that is already existing right now. So you have to look at the future and try to to guess what the future is going to be. And I think you know, designing games with too much data in mind or trying to. I know some people that are trying to uh, to come up with uh, with you know a product page and test that with marketing before yeah. starting a game. And I I've never heard any good results about that because I think at the end of the day you're just designing your game for for one year ago, when you should design your game for the two to 10 years that's going to come. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, now, talking about game development, there's you know, the, the issue of creating a universally appealing game across nationalities, cultures, and, and gender. You know, do, do you think that we should be focusing on making games that are universal? Because if you look at it, Obviously, gender, you can see quite different uh, behaviors mm -hmm. uh, on top of that. Also, you know, we know what works in, in China or even Japan might not I work know, in the West, yeah. right? So it would be great to hear your views. I don't know, Kathy, if you have something to shed light on this. Um, well, I think before diving in, uh, let's take a look at the global gaming market and yeah. define how a universal global successful appealing game look like today, yeah. right? So today, the gaming industry is uh, a yearly more than 100, I think this year, breaking 120 billion US dollar uh, industry. And there are more than 2.3 billion active players, among them more than 1 billion are paying. Yeah. This number is growing very fast as well. Of course, it's a very, very brutally competitive. Every day, I think it's around 1,500 new mobile games launch on iOS and Google Play, uh, only 20, top 20 generating most of the revenues. So if we talk about a universal successful appealing game, that game uh, at least generates more than 1 billion US dollar a year. That, that's how it looks like. Uh, so now looking at um, uh, vertical breakdowns in terms of game genres and target audience, uh, different markets, um, I think retention and monetization are two good tools to help us and also to understand the story we are looking at. 
taking localization, for example. Uh, our game right now has been tested in Middle East. Uh, a region, partly localization is very important. However, the balance we have in mind is actually to keep a very subtle, even minimal uh, localization to ensure a later global uh, potential. And after all, I think uh, game designs reflect our um, values. And values should be fair and neutral, uh, cross borders, genders, uh, cultures. And, and it should not take sides. Yeah. Uh, if we expand this topic even beyond games, it's, it's like um, genders and cultures, even religions can be very local, but, but humanity is, is mm. universal. So I think that philosophy should apply on games. Yeah, well. I agree with that. I have a point on that. But before I get there, Roberta, do you have any views on this? Yeah, I think the, the, the output, output is the quality of the input. So what we, what we do is to make sure that we have a very diverse team yeah. uh, in terms of gender, in terms of colors, in terms of age, uh, nationality. So we now are almost 100 people in the company, and we have 20 nationalities. Nice. It helps that we're in London, so yeah. we attract, until Brexit, we attract <laughs> a lot of people from the world. And, and I think that on itself yeah. creates a high density of different inputs as we're creating games. And so the, our games have a much wider appeal globally. Okay, great, wonderful. Martial, what about at OBB? Well, I think there is something about sincerity. If you try yeah. to design a game that is for everyone, every market, every gender, you, it's yeah. going gonna, gonna to fall flat. Yeah. And you know, science is universal. It's applied everywhere, in every hospital, in every university, all around the world. But creativity is something very personal that comes from you, your history, your background. And you have to, uh, this is really a mix of, of both because of course, there are tricks and there are recipes to create a global game. But if you try to uh, appeal to everyone, at the end of the day, you're going to appeal to no one. So it really comes from your past, your background, uh, your team, and your personality, and do something that is really sincere. And, uh, and that's going to be really fun for players. And eventually, if the game is good enough, it's going to be a global success. But trying to be too global, I think, will, uh, will not fly in the long term. No, I agree with that. And, and on your point in terms of bringing people together, um, you know, I think it's really amazing that we're seeing people play against each other when, you know, in, in, in war zones where they're actually on both sides of the conflict, yeah, yeah. children from both sides, mm. and they don't necessarily know who's on the other side. And when they do, they realize they've been playing with, let's say, the enemy yeah. Uh, for a very long time. So it can be a very uniting factor. And I think uh, there's some wonderful games coming out too that are, you know, creating empathy as well across people who are in difficult situations and you can, through the game, understand what people are going through. There's a wonderful game about bringing uh, your wife home from, uh, or bring your wife to uh, Europe from Syria and the travel that they have to do to sort of travel from Syria. And I think it's really inspiring. Um, so yeah, I mean, games, games for good, really. I don't know. For oh, compassion. Yeah. It, it's, it's really interesting because there's this whole debate that you actually are going, spending longer time on the front of screens. But when, you, when you're playing a game different to when you are in a social network, you're actually connecting much more. You're either connecting because you're going to battle against each other or collaborate to do something together. Yeah. And uh, what, what we hear all the time from all sorts of people who play, let's say, World of Drift, which is a massive multiplayer online, is that they, they start to create their own particular roles inside the game yeah. that it's not who they are in the real life. Mm. But it's that second self yeah. that they are very happy to be there and to enjoy with others. And it's all about connection. I 100% agree. I, I mean, I it comes, comes to a question, yeah. um, you know, where, where people, you know, there's, there's a sort of, the, the, the world is concerned. There's lots of people concerned. Particular media is concerned with the excessive use of games, right? Mm. And, and they use word of addiction, um, which I'm not sure is appropriate because I think it's excessive. I don't think people are really addicted. But, um, but there's also the violent content. People are very concerned that, you know, whenever thing, bad things happen, people talk about, oh, it's the games, it's causing people to, to react in a certain way. I don't know, Kathy, if, if you have some views on this and what your thoughts are. Well, I think, uh, first of all, it's, uh, as a game maker, it's yeah. really, uh, first, our responsibility to take pride in making games as a state of art intellectual quest, a meaningful conversation, interaction with players with respect, 
rather than view game as a money making tool to scheme human nature, to trap addiction. And trust me, there are companies like that, operating like that out there. So I think we need to make them feel shameful in doing so. And at Waffle Games, we focus on making mid-core strategy games. Uh, as a chess player, of course, I'm a strategy gamer at heart. In my view, I think um, good strategy games is just like chess. Mm. It's a practice of sought discipline. It's a training of problem-solving skills. At the same time, it's, it's amazingly fun as well, so it can be beneficial. And I actually have a little bit personal story um, to this um, question, which I haven't really shared with anyone, including my mom. It's one of my defining moments. Mm. Um, so that happened around like three, four weeks ago. I was traveling in the US. Uh, my mom called me at one night telling me that my grandpa had a severe heart attack and was passing away. Oh. I was there 30 hours away watching someone I love the most passing away, yet I, have, I can't do anything. So I remember I sat on the hotel floor for two hours in dark, in tears, in desperation. Until I reached out to my phone and started to play games and chat with my Alliance members, at that moment, if it, it, it's like somehow a safe outlet, an escape happened to me and somehow I feel better. And I start to think, sometimes we often criticize people, say, who run away from the real world, uh, say they are weak or they are running away from the real problems. But if we be compassionate and be honest with ourselves for a moment, and we all sometimes need a little escape from a brutal moment, from, from a cruel situation you have no control, so we can come back, restore our vulnerability, continue to believe in, in dream, in, in beauty, in magic. Yeah. And we all need to be sometimes a little childlike yeah. in the magical world, yeah. in games, and to, to, to away from sometimes it's just a little too real, too cold. <laughs> grow up adult worlds. That's so that's how I feel about it. Wow, that's really powerful. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's um, uh, Roberta, you know, when we're talking about it, I mean, what you're talking about is is the community, right? That and the support that actually sometimes these games can provide to people. So it becomes your your network. And um, it is a very different world from our real world. But maybe, maybe just as maybe just as real. I don't know. What's your view? Yeah, I, I think we, we underestimate the, 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 power, the power of the internet and connection and games with the new generations, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, they are growing up in a, in a totally different environment, very different to us, and they are embedded into, into the, the artificial, not the artificial, but you know, the, the online world, like Ready Player One. And so for them, I don't think there is a distinguish, they don't distinguish anymore, like who, yeah. What, what is it online? What is offline? It's just, you know, I just, I'm just fluid. I'm going through the, the worlds and through the connections. And I mean, human beings are all, all about growth and connection, right? Yeah. And, and games offer that to them. Mm. And I don't think the, you know, young kids are kind of bothering as much as we are about the springtime. They're actually just being much more fluid than us. They are much more evolved. The, world, <laughs> the worlds are colliding. They're coming together to do yeah. the world in the real world, which is very cool. And um, if I knew, now move uh, to another question, you know, about Europe, really, and Europe's yeah. um, ability to create many great games. So obviously, we have Supercell and Rovio here, but uh, King and Mojang and all these companies. And I've just, Marcial, I just wanted to ask, you know, you know, why do you think Europe has been able to create these games? And maybe tell us a little bit about you know, the French yeah, yeah. version of it as I, well. I'm not going to try to explain the, the Finnish ecosystem to... Uh, the Finns. To, 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 yeah, to yeah the that's Finns. not very I, helpful, I would not be it? really good at <laughs> that. But I, I know, at least in France, we have this, uh, this background of, like, being very scientific, scientific and uh, wow. this numerous uh, technological breakthrough wow. over the years, and at the same time uh, being very interested in uh, in the arts and creativity. And now the, the luxury industry, for example, is one of the biggest industry industry in France. And uh, even uh, cinema and uh, cinematography was invented was invented in France, and special effects were wow. invented by by Georges Méliès. And uh, even today, something people usually don't know, but the despicable 
Despicable Me movies, they are all made in France. So we have this huge artistic industry with some very great technological talents, uh, with uh, top schools and, uh, and top engineers that actually are pretty cheap if you compare to, uh, to the West Coast uh, yeah. you know, in the US. So the mix of these two right. very strong industries can create uh, great games, get great studios. We have Ubisoft, we have uh, amazing things happening on the mobile scene in France where we hope we can beat the fiends to it uh, in, a, in a few years. So I think this really comes down to this mix of these two strong pillars of uh, artistic creativity and, uh, and technological excellence. Amazing, cool. Roberta, do you have any views on, on European games? Yeah, I'm Brazilian, so they yeah, go. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You've lived in Europe, right? So let's come on. For, for 12 Work years now, and I'm British as well. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, think, I think it's, uh, it's important, the, 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 the melting pot. I, I love London because of the melting pot of creativity and science and everything together. So when you align the, the excellence in, in, in design, in graphic design, with excellence in game design, and everything in between in terms of you know, coding, I think you can create some pretty amazing magic. So I, yeah, I, no wonder Europe is kind of winning in the games industry. Wonderful. Can no. I just add one sentence yeah, to add? Because oh, I know I'm not yeah. I, mean, I, know, I, I was kind of thinking, it, you know. I, I just want to say that uh -huh. uh, China hasn't been leading the innovation, but oh. I think it's changing because it new generation is, is coming up. So I hope um, me and my fellow entrepreneurs, I hope you guys watch us. Oh, always do with, you know, <laughs> reverence. <laughs> uh, China is obviously is, a, is an unbelievable story. You know, if you look at the fantastic games that are coming through there, um, in fact, you are the ones who are creating the biggest games at the moment. So I thought that was a given. So, I mean, China is a wonderful <laughs> no, place but, for games. But innovation is something that uh, we are learning yes. and so much from this region. And, and I, I love what Rebecca said. It's, it's about melting pot. It's about you have the deep roots of culturally proud mm -hmm. generation, yet you have a global um, perspective as a global citizen. Great. So I'm going to have one more question. And then we're going to get some questions from the crowd. So I hope when I open up the app, there's going to be some questions there. Come on, people. <laughs> All right, cool. So looking forward to games, the future of games, you know, what kind of games or platforms are you most excited about? Should I start? Let's okay. go for it. Uh, well, I think I don't think I don't really think in terms of platform, but I think uh, in terms of social innovation. And you know, these days, you know, gaming genres they have been uh, there for for 20, 30 years, and we don't see so many game genres being created on a on a regular basis. But I think social innovation, you know, trying to find a, a social recipe or a way to connect people that has never been done before, or that can be even more meaningful uh, to what we have. And we were talking about you know excessive screen time. And I think the main difference is between social networks and, and games is that our goal as yeah. game maker is to make people happy yeah. and, and to enjoy our product. Mm. And you know, outside Facebook, there is nothing like Facebook. So and as game maker, you know there are like thousands of games out there. So if you game doesn't make people happy, they will go to another game. And so we have to, uh, to, make, to take this happiness to the extra level. And I think on top of that, you know, uh, adding a new layer of connection and, and Today, the best games, the, the best selling game, the, the most successful game, they're able to do that, to achieve that. So I'm really looking forward to uh, everything we can do to connect the real world and the, vit the virtual world, as Roberta was saying. I really think that's the, that's the way of the future. Great. Roberta, do you have? I think there is something about, um, I'm very, very excited about the, the move from this gig economy to the hobby economy. So when I look at uh, streamers and people who became media, right? So we all now used to create media on, on YouTube, on Instagram, on, you know, on our phones all the time, and we're sharing with the world. And what I see right now, the whole ecosystem that, that, that's being built around platforms like Twitch, they are actually impacting massively the way that we're thinking about games and the way that we actually monetize our games and interact with, with their audiences, right? Yeah. So we're actually uh, engaging with them also for them to engage with their audience because they are building their audience. So, so I, I feel really excited about that because it, it's, a, it's a massive break on the traditional way of doing marketing uh, from a cost of acquisition to PR and everything. It's all about engaging with others so that they engage with millions of people to play your games. Awesome. 
Yeah, I, I think it's still mobile. I think mobile will still provide the continuous growth. Um, but we see mobile, I, uh, I think there's one big opportunity which we are right now taking uh, in making this kind of PC total war like uh, real time full control. Uh, on mobile, but with uh, excessively use, uh, easy user experience, which the opportunity is. You see the, um, the huge successful uh, PC console games, they haven't really had their success on mobile platform. No. Um, but I do think that a deeper, say, more engaging um, game on mobile with very easy user experience uh, is going to be uh, exciting. So that, that's Great. Fine. Cool. Well, this is actually a little bit complicated. The games come, the, the questions come in, they disappear, they come back. <laughs> so look, let me just see what we got here. Um, so I think the one that maybe we'll go for here is, is about youth and how people get into gaming. So what advice would you have for young people trying to enter the games industry? This is from Anonymous. All right. So dear Anonymous, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I see today the, the, the opportunity and the chance like people want to enter the game industry is no. you have so many tools no. at your service and, it, and these tools are so easy to use that you should make a game. You know, no. back when we were uh, younger, I look young, but I, I'm a bit older than that. <laughs> um, it was difficult. You, you needed to be a good programmer. And no. now these days, you, you can make a game with almost nothing, with a PC or even a, a phone or, or a tablet. So just, just make a game. Just make a lot of games. And, and you'll see what you want to do if you want to be a designer, an artist, or a programmer. That's the um, best yeah. thing I would recommend. If, if you are cold, there's nothing preventing you from, from creating a game. Yeah. Unity is so accessible, yeah. right? So there's no excuse. If you, if you want to do something else, I think there's, there, are, there are a few rules. Traditionally, it has been QA. So people go into QA to, to get into a games company, and therefore, they, they learn more about the games and go into, the, into new careers. Um, we hired a couple of YouTubers over the years, which, uh, again, everything that I'm saying, it's about engaging with them and creating this new economy. We've got 13 seconds uh, left. <laughs> well, so. uh, I think it's, uh, you're going to love the game. For, for me, I, I'm, I, I'm a gamer, but I was not from the industry by diving. And if you love it, nothing going to prevent you. Wonderful. So science or creativity, <laughs> I don't think we answered the question. <laughs> Both are really important. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.